that's the case, the better question is not really about where ideas come from, but about how one can recognize which of them are promising as fictional prospects. She already comprehends that not all conceptions are worth pursuing, and she desires the selection process to be efficient. And I never have the heart to tell her that, selecting as wisely as she may, she will still try out some duds, suggestions that won't work for her. Shadowy forest of fiction writing presents many a tempting trail. The outsets are fresh and flower bordered, but many, not most, lead to dead ends and brambly thickets. But let us not discourage the hopeful talents of an earnest seeker. I'll try to answer the question about ideas. I shan't pretend to answer with perfect accuracy for the process of tracing the association of ideas is not ordered. At least, in my case, it's not orderly, but in my case, nothing's orderly. <laughs> Some years ago, I was chatting with an accomplished novelist, short story writer, Mr. R. B. Castle. Vernon has passed from us now, but he was a nifty raconteur, was able to put forth all sorts of wise hints about the craft of composition. <coughs> When we chatted upon the topic of story ideas, Berlin said that he liked, once he came upon a viable notion, to turn it over and around in his mind, like a large jewel. He said, I can see what different lights, shades, each different facet of the idea displays. I thought his analogy was just spitty. Upon the instant, I imagine myself with an idea for a story in my hands as solid as a stone. I turned it this way, glass and splendid colors rayed out from it as from a polished diamond as big as a baseball. Unfortunately, that instant of delight did not reveal what this solid idea actually was. <laughs> I was still waiting to find out <laughs> with bated breath. But let me speak somewhat of a situation I suspect is more common among writers in this regard. That of feeling you do have an idea or a story, but cannot figure out exactly what it is. It's nebulous, it's intangible, with no possibility of being turned in the hand. It's not invisible, may not even exist. No more than a tinge in the atmosphere of the mind that Yet you feel there's something there, or that something could be made to be there that just might possibly develop into something. This is the case when one experiences an emotion mysteriously and cannot attach it to an objective element, neither a character nor a situation, neither a form nor an image, neither a shape nor a detail. You have to begin in a tenuous mist, but you must arrive at a defined and recognizable destination. T.S. Eliot surmised that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet in this kind of emotional days. That way, he said, lacked an objective relative. That is, it lacked a single situation or motivating incident equal to the torrent of emotion it expressed. Well, I would not dare to speak to Hamlet, but the compositional situation Eliot surmises is well enough known to writers, I think, though it's probably more common to lyric poets than to authors of murder mysteries. Something is nibbling at my attention, one thinks. It's a feeling of confused elements. There's sadness in it, joy, humor, fear, happy reassurance. When one has said so much, the realization that it attaches to some episode of personal life is nigh inescapable. In my case, I recalled a brief period when my father and I lived together without the company of my mother. She'd gone to California to visit her brother. While she was away, my father conceived a wonderful surprise for her. He and I would plant a garden in the fallow field across the stream that ran by our yard and build a real bridge across the stream. 
We succeeded in doing so. Both of us were very proud of our handiwork. I was the prouder, being about 11 years old. But a sudden flood washed away our bridge and ruined much of the garden. <coughs> We were surveying the wreckage, chagrined and angry, my mother arrived upon the scene. <laughs> then there came into being that complex knot of emotions I described, sadness, joy, humor, and the rest of it. So I had an incident, and I set it down as best I could, but it was not a story, it was only an anecdote, lacking that final click the hasp lock in the hasp to snap it together lay unfinished for a long time. And one day I was talking with a brilliant story writer, Mary Ann Gainer, who passed on an axiom about short stories she had heard from her colleague at the university over in Chapel Hill. <coughs> this was Max Steele, a classic author himself, a fabled and eccentric writing teacher. A story, Professor Field steel in tone cannot end with a sentiment. Now, on the face of it, this is a plausible principle. It's not advisable to try to write a story about coal miners detailing their hardships and poverty and the mortal dangers of their daily lives. And then in the last scenes tell us that they all turned into willow trees and swept the earth clean with their drooping winds. <laughs> that is to say, you cannot write a naturalistic, fairly realistic story, emphasizing physical detail, dogged mood, and then he's exchanged these terms for others more fanciful and artificially poetized. That is common sense. <laughs> but what kind of writer wants to adopt common sense as an artistic guideline? <laughs> A writer may espouse many principles and obey a few directives, but none of these principles or directives begins with the phrase, thou shalt not. My favorite directive is but a single word, Stephen. <laughs> I thought me the tale of Noah's Ark, of the flood, and the contract God made with Noah and sealed with a symbol. <clears throat> I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. But, my last for the debating point, that's not the end of the story. It's only an episode. The story of Noah continues and does not close with a symbolic image. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. In short, I could recall no narrative that defied Max Steele's law, so I decided to devise one of my own. After a bunch of fruitless efforts, I came up with these sentences. The tear on my mother's face got larger and larger. It detached from her face and became a shiny glow, widening outward like an inflating balloon. At first, the tear floated in the air between them, but as it expanded, it took my mother and father into itself. I saw them suspended, separate, but beginning to drift slowly toward each other. <coughs> then my mother looked past my father's shoulder, looked through the bright skin of the tear at me. The tear enlarged until at last it took me in too. It was warm and salty. And soon as I got used to the strange light inside the tear, I began to slim, swim clumsily toward my parents. Now that I read that passage, isolated from its preceding pages, I'm not a duly impressed. It's highly sentimental, more than a little precious. But I've lived with these faults and others for a very long time and have become resigned to them. It's more important to me at the time of writing to see if I could successfully end a story with a symbol. And I thought maybe I'd got away with it if the sentences were read indulgently. 